So continuing on with chapter 8, here is the first chunk with previous videos, and now we're on to rolling resistance, almost to the end. Rolling resistance. This is an interesting thing. So consider the friction force of either a tire on a road or a bowling ball. When would that friction force actually slow the object down? And there's a big difference between something that is sliding along the ground. If it's sliding, like leaving tread marks behind, that is where you would use kinetic friction and where the friction force actually has a play in what the object is doing. If you are not sliding, that's not kinetic friction. That would actually be a little spot of static friction and it would not slow the object down. If I draw a velocity profile across this bowling ball, so it's going forward as well as rotating. And the velocity of each point on this bowling ball is a combination of the entire thing going forward and rotational motion. And since the lower part of this is rotating backwards, that forward motion of the ball and the negative motion of the rotation cancel out with one another so that the velocity of where the tire hits, where the ball hits the ground, if it's not sliding, this would actually be a zero velocity spot. So there's, there's no motion with that little contact point and there's no friction force. So theoretically, this thing could keep rolling forever. If this was a flat surface and it's not skidding, so the velocity of the ball going forward matches the rotational velocity of the ball coming back and it's, it's got traction, then it would just keep going and going infinitely and it would never stop if there was no air drag or something. But we know that's not true, that the rolling object does stop. And it stops because of what's happening at this contact point. Let's think about some examples of contact points. So here is a train wheel versus a rubber car wheel. Looking at these two wheels, which one do you think is more energy efficient? Okay, so just think about that for a second, and then I'm going to jump over to the Wikipedia page, and we're going to read a little bit about train tires versus smushy car tires. Okay, so here we are on that Wikipedia page, and this is energy efficiency in transport. So it has comparisons of everything from walking and biking to all kinds of different passenger vehicles, airplanes, boats, and I'm going to just scroll down here. This is an interesting read. Energy efficiency is extremely important. And um, so here we go. Here we are at the train section. Trains are, in general, one of the most efficient means of transport for, for freight and passengers. Now, this is like if you fill a train all the way up with passengers versus just two people on a car, if you're carpooling or something. So if you're looking at the weight it hauls versus the amount of fuel you put into the thing, we're getting some, some really, really efficient numbers out of here. And all of this comes from is the low friction of steel wheels on steel rails. Now they are calling this friction here and rolling resistance is part of the friction chapter but we'll talk through it a bit and it's, it's actually something a little different than friction. It is material deformation that's happening at the point of contact. So this is different than one surface sliding along another. This is going to be one surface actually deforming when it comes in contact with another surface which is two very different things but it acts kind of like friction, and so everybody talks about it like it's friction, even though it actually isn't. Okay, so when you look at friction on steel, steel on steel versus rubber tires on asphalt, you're going to want to go check your tire pressure after this because your tire pressure is extremely important to the energy efficiency of your car. You can maybe keep track of how many times you're filling up versus how many miles you've traveled, and if you start 
looking at your tire pressure, that's it's a really important thing. Okay, and of course, efficiency is going to vary with passenger loads and and if you're in the city or the country, going up hills or not. But um, it's, yeah, if you look at general overall, what's happening is pa passenger transportation by rail systems is much more efficient than cars or planes or boats, especially, especially in the urban context. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really sad that we don't have more trains in the United States. If you go to a lot of other countries, you really don't have to have a car. In fact, we were in New York City a while ago and talked with some people that said, oh, you actually have to buy a car? And we we parked our rental car. We actually gave it back to the rental agency because it was a lot better deal to just take the subways than to drive around and try and find a parking spot and fight with traffic. But the subways in New York City were so reliable and came so often that that was that it was a great form of transportation and it wasn't you know a matter of cost or anything it was it was great so hopefully in the future we'll be seeing more more trains okay so popping back here and I specifically grabbed a picture with a semi flat tire so that you can really visualize the deformation and this this could be the tire deforming it could also be the ground deforming. So if you're driving across mud or some kind of deformable surface, there's there's two pieces to the deformation that happen here. But kind of like the axle friction, what you're going to do is if this tire is moving forward, you're going to think about where the reaction for this thing is going to happen. And the reaction is going to be up here at the front. So the ground is kind of pushing back against it. And this time, instead of thinking of that backwards force as a friction force, that's actually the force to deform the tire. So you have the same normal force, but then this rolling resistance thing is deforming the tires. And where that's hitting the ground at, we're going to use this length. So you have the weight of the weight of the car and some kind of a moment pushing the car forward and it's resisting that motion going forward. So we can we can start thinking about triangles again and we're going to look at this length that, that the thing is deformed with. Now let me pop to some figures out of the book. Once again, we can either think of this as an equivalent system where that rolling resistance acts like a moment that is resisting the force, or we can put that reaction force up at the front of it where that deformation is happening. This length B then becomes similar to like what our friction coefficient is. So our moment which is going to be the forward force that we're pushing this thing with. So think about that bowling ball example again. If there was no resistance down there, it would roll and roll and roll and roll. But because it deforms, you have to push it forward somehow. So there's some force pushing it forward. And if you look at the moment that that force generates, there's some kind of an RF, and that needs to be there to fight against what is happening down here. So you can look at P times R. They call this force P again. I really wish they wouldn't do that. So it's not a pressure. It is a force, even though they call it P. Pressure times this radius is going to equal the weight times this distance b. So let's go ahead and take the moment around the point where the tire is actually resisting motion. So this is where we're taking the, the moment around. And you can see that weight times B is going to be fighting 
against that P times R. So hopefully you can see that. So we have the weight trying to rotate one way and P times R trying to rotate the other way. But it's, and again, this is not a friction coefficient. That B ends up being a distance of the size of the deformation that's happening on that wheel, between the wheel and the ground. But it, it looks very similar to friction, so a lot of people refer to it as a friction. So here we go. Here's an example problem with one of these things. So what we have, we've got a, and let's go ahead and write on it, a 900 kilogram machine. So we've got some kind of a weight acting down on it. 900, we'll have to add G in there. And it's being <coughs> rolled along a concrete floor using a bunch of pipes. And we have a pipe diameter. Knowing the coefficient of rolling resistance, so this is that B that we talked about early. The coefficient of rolling resistance is 0 0.5 between, let me highlight where this is, 0 0.5 between the pipe and the base. So at the top, it's going to be 0 0.5. And 1.25 between the pipes and the concrete floor. So at the base, it's going to be 1.25. Find the magnitude of the force P. So here's what we're trying to get. We, don't, we want to know what that P is if we want to slowly move the base along the floor. So we're not accelerating it. We're just barely overcoming that rolling resistance, so it, it's going to kind of feel like a statics problem. If we draw a free body diagram of this system, so there are three forces acting on it. Where this force ends up contacting is going to be at the, at the top of the smoosh, so it kind of smooshes out at the top and it smooshes at the bottom. So we have two rolling resistance. And if I draw the forces acting on this pipe, the forces are really only acting on it at two places. At the top, and it's going to be holding the weight as well as that forward pushing force, and at the bottom. So the bottom, that is going to be that resistance. OK, so we've got the weight on this thing, mg. And we can figure out, if we add these things head to tail, head to tail, so P going forward, weight going down, and that's going to add together to our reaction force. We have to figure out what this angle is. And that angle is a function of what's happening at the top and the bottom of this thing. So, so draw in just kind of a nice big triangle here. And the forces are in the same direction as this. So we can look at what that angle is formed with. So we have the deformation on the top and the bottom. We're adding both of those things together. And then we'll say that we'll keep the diameter of this thing. So the diameter is 100 millimeters tall. So using those two dimensions, opposite over adjacent, and tangent versus sine. So this is actually going to be a little bit more accurate using sine. So we'll, we'll call this the hypotenuse from one side to the other is the diameter. So here's our angle. And with that, we can walk around this triangle. We know our weight. And we can solve for what force we have to push forward with it. And again, if there wasn't any deformation at all, it wouldn't take a force to push it. It would just go on its own almost. But because it's deforming, that entire force that you're pushing forward on it comes from how much those pipes are deforming. So then you can think about your car, how much of the gas in your car goes to pushing your smushy tires around. And that's, you know, that's, that's something to think about.